Dr. Jekyll needs to make the ham and eggs. Not a huge fan of Satan. Just saying. Didn't like him on Facebook. Real question is, will Rihanna be at the game? I was the perfect child, Jason. Mm. If a pelican played a raptor, that's not even a fair fight. Yeah, boy, let's go. Yeah. All right, back to work. (laughs) This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. Interviews and insight from this week in Cougar Sports. Every Saturday, only on BYU Radio. To lead off, here's the double coverage interview of the week. Joining us now on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline, friend of the program, NFL Super Bowl champion and Pro Football Hall of Famer, BYU legend Steve Young. Steve, always nice to catch up. How are you? That was great. Great, great, great. Hey, uh, especially after be BYU yeah, beats uh, number 14 Boise State and really stuns the nation. What would you think of BYU's upset of the 14th rank and previously unbeaten Broncos with a third-string quarterback <laughs> last Saturday night? We need something for schizophrenia. We need to uh, figure out how to <laughs> – we got to figure that out. I, I, you know, it, it's just inexplicable. Uh, and I, I saw something was written maybe on Twitter – you know, before the game, so it would be so BYU to go beat the uh, Boise State, and then they won. And they said, "I this one aged well." You know, it was so BYU to pull it off. <laughs> I think you guys are talking about some of the foundational issues, and um, the good news, no matter what, is these kind of wins, marquee, no matter what the record is, do help because our our conference is the conference of ESPN. Um, we've talked about this before on the show. And being this is our conference, we have to uh, perform for them. And these kind of games actually do help. And so it does matter. Uh, uh, and so I think that's an important thing um, to kind of keep, keep pace on the contract. And that's really kind of our lifeblood. Now we've got to figure out how we're going to uh, extend. I think uh, Kalani clearly took control of the defense last week. Some of this is Kalani watching him grow up into a more mature head coach. Uh, I'm watching him uh, take more uh, uh, of the reins. Uh, I sense that, and I think that the defense will be better off for it. Uh, what I would suggest for him is that uh, he would be, uh, you know, like Bill Belichick. You you design defenses, you run defenses, you call defenses, and you find somebody to deal with the offense, and uh, um, and you don't worry about it. And uh, and I think that if he, you know. Um, and I think that's where they are today, to be honest with you. I think that he's taking control of the defense. He's going to call the defenses. And, um, and, uh, and he's telling the offense to, to light it up. Let's, be, let's, let's grasp the history of BYU. Let's hold on to every inch of it. And uh, everyone will expect us to be BYU, which is we're going to throw it around. And now what – if you think about BYU, and I know you guys have asked me this question, but I'm just going to go into a little solo for you here <laughs> since I don't get a chance. My kids – my brother, my boy's in music theater, Manhattan School of Music, and my other boy doesn't really like football. We don't watch much football. This is my big shot to talk football. So, <laughs> really, you guys, this? You guys, you guys get it. This is, a, this is my you – know, I'm on the couch right now. So, if you, uh, you know, here, here's what I would do at BYU. It, historically, we weren't able to beat teams because we were better athletes or we're fit, bigger, faster, or stronger. But we would act out execute teams, and we would do things that were, especially with a with a passing game, and that's why we were famous. And um, now uh, the schedule we have in Independence, it's even more so that we're not going to line up and run the plays from LSU and be bigger, stronger, faster than anybody. Now people can argue and go, Steve, we're, you know, we're we're right in there. We're okay, uh, fine. Let's not argue. Let's just say that fundamentally, foundationally, over time, BYU is not going to be bigger, faster, or stronger than when we go play all the teams that we, we play in independence. So if that's the case, uh, how are we going to win? We're going to win on execution. And, uh, and we can out-execute anybody. And we can ask our players to uh, study more, turn off the TV on Thursdays and Fridays and memorize. It's exactly how the Patriots have found their edge. Why are the Patriots better than everybody? Because they've conditioned players to go home and study and actually memorize so that they can have you know, 15 wrinkles instead of three. They can have, you know, they don't have just at halftime. They just bring out the other half of the playbook that they've studied and memorized over the last, you know, uh, uh, seven days. They can ask so much more of their players. And so we can do that for, that's our edge. And so we need to find an offense that is high on execution. And think about the boys that we scored last week. And I was so invested. I, I couldn't sleep for a couple hours after I was so invested in this game. <laughs> how did we make our play? How did we make our plays? We, it was this execution, unique kind of – I don't think we have double reverse flea flickers every down. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is find an offense that we can use 
our execution expertise and not necessarily line up and just kind of pound at people. And, uh, and I think that they're going to, we're learning that we're figuring out how to do that. And, uh, I'm just, I, I, I can't help, but at the end of the day, feel excited for what I'm not going to ignore. I'm going to ignore Toledo. I'm going to ignore USF. I'm just going to be excited about how we're finding how we're going to be great. And I think Kalani is growing into how to, how to, ask the players to be great and, and, and live up to the schedule and actually start to threaten. Let's talk about the quarterback enough, situation. Enough. Oh, enough, no, no, enough let's keep me. going. You Stay on that couch. Now. Get comfortable. Put a pillow behind your back. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about the quarterback situation. So certainly Zach Wilson showed some real highlights, broke his thumb against Toledo. Jaron Hall uh, gets a concussion against uh, South Florida. In comes Baylor Romney and beats Boise State. I mean, it was great coaching. Now BYU has three capable quarterbacks waiting for Zach Wilson perhaps to get back at the end of the season. By week, Utah State next week. Uh, we've been talking all week, Steve, about Jaron Hall's probably the guy you start, uh, but Baylor Romney's certainly a capable backup. What do you think of the quarterback situation? Uh, we got some guys that can play. Now, uh, Baylor, was I loved it because he's the kind of guy that you call a play and he'll execute it. He'll, he'll, he won't disappoint you, you know, and, and, and that, there's a real skill in that. And I don't know, we have no idea how expansive he can be or the ceiling that he has, but a kid that just shows up, you call a play and he executes it is a real talent. And so I love that. I love that you get the full measure of the play calling. It makes, you know, play callers love quarterbacks like Baylor Romney because he's going to, he's going to run your play. He's not going to kind of devise something new in the huddle and go do it. And the ball gets snapped and then you run, you know, three other plays that are not, are not part of the play call in the huddle. And I think there's a real talent there and I'd love to see more of him. Uh, and Jaron, we just haven't seen. So I just look forward to seeing more of him and what he's capable of doing. But uh, what I love of Baylor is just, you know, uh, is, a, is unappreciated uh, by a lot of people. But uh, somebody that I, if I was a play caller and I thought I was better than most, I'd want a quarterback like that. Steve Young with us on BYU Sports Nation. Let's get right to the heart of it. On a bye week after beating Boise State, Steve, Baylor Romney has that positive momentum. He's got the juju, the mojo, whatever you want to call it. Jaron Hall's trying to get healthy after that concussion, yet he is the clear backup, and coaches decided that based on spring football and thousands of reps. So who would you start to keep the momentum rolling against Utah State, a tricky game in Logan? If it was me, I would play Baylor just because we've got some consistency. And the quarterback spot, you know, I grew up in an era with uh, Joe Montana and myself. We were thrown together. Bill Walsh would, you know, he would come in before the game and say, hey, Joe, Steve's going to play a half here. We, we'd be playing Monday night in Chicago. And, uh, and so I'm not worried about the feelings of the quarterbacks. That's the, there's not a toxic personality there. They'll work it out over time, and it'll all work out. But I think when you've got a guy that's playing okay and leading teams to big victories, I talk – Jaron hasn't played much, and so there's not that uh, sense that there's a earned spot. I would, I'd stay with it, and then, but I would tell Jaron, say, look, if he sl- starts slow, he's coming out. You're playing. <laughs> like we won't make the switch. We won't. We won't make the switch on Tuesday, because that just doesn't feel like the thing to do for the for the mo- Like you said, like the mojo of the team. Like we're, we're going to keep this going, but everyone recognizes that you're warming up, and you're going to take a full. You know, well. We'll give you 40% of the, of the snaps, give uh, Baylor 60, and Baylor's going to go play. And if he plays well, he's going to keep going. If he doesn't, you're, you're in there. And I think that's just – I'm not a I, – I, I, we're too careful with quarterbacks. And, you know, as long as you don't have a toxic personality, which none of these guys are, you, you, it's not a problem. It puts people on edge. I call it creative tension. And the creative tension actually gets the most out of everybody. It got the most out of Joe and I, and, uh, and I have no problem saying things like that. Great stuff, Steve. Let's finish with this. Can anybody beat Kyle Van Noy and the New England Patriots in the NFL? No. What happened, and this is a this is the lesson for Kalani and for, for all BYU, for all of us, because we we should have learned this a long time ago. Um, the way that the Patriots are great, and it was so evident on Monday night. I sat there with my, you know on the sidelines watching this. The Patriots. Everyone knows that as players, just lining up as as, as athletes, they're not they're not a cut above athletically they're a cut above intellectually they're cut above in, in strategy and that strategy comes from the coaches who extend in a, in a game that's becoming more college-like 
Now follow me here. In the spring, you get a couple OTAs. In the summer, you get a little uh, summer camp. And it's very college-like. The amount of time that coaches and players are together in the pros today is very college-like. And because of that, they don't get the sophistication that they used to have. What have the Patriots done? They've leaned into that and demand players that show up in New England, you will turn the TV off Wednesday, Thursday, Friday night. You will memorize three or four times as much as anyone in the league. And in doing that, we're going to be able to out-execute anybody. And if you build a, a, a culture over 20 years, and I've heard it from Tom, I've heard it from Randy Moss, I've heard it from Teddy Bruschi, anyone that was there, it is different. And what's happened is you see them out there, and they have these little wrinkles, and they have 10 of them. And they, they bring them out in the first quarter, in the second quarter. And Sam Darnold, what did he say? I, I'm, I'm seeing, seeing ghosts. ghosts. I'm seeing ghosts. You don't say that as a quarterback unless you really are. <laughs> you really, and I, I, think, I, think he literally, I think he literally was seeing ghosts. Because that's what – and everybody goes, well, that's what Bill Belichick does. Okay. No, it's because the culture of what he's built demand. And we have players that we can do that, and they won't turn on us and say, oh, I'm not studying. And then you hold them accountable. And then it's, it's uh, and that's our advantage. It was our advantage in 1975. It's our advantage in 1983. It's our advantage in 1990. And it's got to be our advantage in 2019. And if we can ask our players to go and be like the Patriots and study and learn and have a thousand wrinkles, and we can out execute anyone in the country, and we can make up for anything else that we lack. I'm not going to say we're, we're not bigger, faster, stronger. Not, well, don't worry about it. But if we do lack that, we're going to be able to make up for it. And, uh, and so that's how I would think about it. Steve Young, literally as a couch quarterback today, leading us to victory. Great to catch I, up with you, man. I, 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 I needed this. I, guys, I needed this. this is, <laughs> I, I feel so much better. I feel so much better. <laughs> hey, we're here for you. Let's do it again soon. Okay, guys. You got it, Steve Young. You got it. Steve Young on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline. Deseret First, you know why we show how. Always great to have Steve on. Great insight. Great uh, opinions. Thanks to start Baylor around me. Fantastic. That was one of our favorite interviews this week. You're listening to the best of BYU Sports Nation. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. Coming into Studio B now is All-American runner for second-ranked BYU women's cross-country, Erica Burke Jarvis. Come on I up. How you doing? Ran, I believe she ran here. Did you catch your breath? <laughs> she, sprint, she sprinted in. No, you're good. Scoot up a little bit into uh, the microphone. Yeah. Okay. Erica, welcome to, to the see show. You. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's, great, it's great to see you. Let's talk about this meteoric rise for this program over the last few years. And it's been consistent, but all the way up to number two, what, what's been the cause of this rise for BYU women's cross country? Um, well, uh, I've been thinking about that just because four years ago, Coach Taylor came, before Coach Taylor came in, I was there and we were barely making it to nationals. And that was like exciting just to get to nationals to na- and to now be ranked second. Like I just... I don't know if like the younger freshmen quite understand like how incredible that is just because it's taken it's taken four years of a lot of hard work and just putting our heads down and running and working hard. You win the pre-nationals invitational. Um, This is at the same site, is it not, of the NCAA championships in a few weeks? So what was that like knowing, okay, in a few weeks, if I do this, this will be even more meaningful, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, it was really cool. Um, I, of course, I believe that the Nationals race will be run quite a bit differently than it was at the pre-Nats race. But it was it's so, so good to just go there and see what the course is like and then see what things you can improve upon in a couple of weeks. Was the course uh, what you thought it would be? Is it something you can you can manage well, you feel like? Because each course is different, right? Yeah, I mean, this course has a special meaning for me just because it was the first time I became All-American was mm. on this course a couple of years ago. So I love this course. And that was after the uh, birth of your kid, Jack, or before? It was before. It was before. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, you're managing that as well. So uh, let's talk about the dynamic of being a mom and also running on a top-five cross-country team. And I want to add that you went on a mission as well. So yeah. you, are, you are just shattering stereotypes left and right, which is yeah. awesome. It's not the traditional like, uh, college experience, but, um, I mean, I just manage it through having help on, from my teammates and especially my coach. I, I realized this year that she's done so much for me. She, like, we just swam, and she watches Jack the whole time while we're swimming laps. Wow. So. 
That's awesome. So Jack's part of the team, right? Yeah. He's like at practice sometimes, right? Yeah, he's at swim practice. <laughs> so. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, your mom ran in the 80s here. Is that where you got the bug to run, or was that something you just loved? Yeah, it must be from my jeans or something. It must be from her. Did, when you were little, was it like, hey, yeah, run? She, she I, encouraged you? What role did that play? Yeah, I just remember her going on runs, and she'd be pushing us in the stroller, and sometimes we'd get out and do a little running. So I think we always grew up watching our mom run. What does Diljeet Taylor mean to this program? Oh, you guys probably know that we love Diljeet. <laughs> she's the best. Like she gives, so, she gives her whole heart to this sport, and really, she's an amazing woman. We're so lucky to have her. What kind of a difference does that make for you when you're on the course? Like, uh, what are you thinking about as you're in the heat of the moment and you're feeling the pain and the hurt and the burn? Like, what what does she do to help you push through that that moment? Uh, I think you just know that you got to. You can't you can't give up because you're running for her part. I mean, you're running for yourself, but you're also running for your coach and your team. And I think we owe it to her to give it our best out there. What is uh, what does this mean to you and the group? Too, it's it's the women's teams and the men's teams where it's like, hey, this is an elite cross country and track program right now. What the what kind of validation is it to be that high in the rankings? Um, it's, I mean, it's awesome. Um, the men have always been ranked really high, so I think it's like cool that we can be close to them now. Are, are you saying, "Hey, we're with you now"? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it, it's really great, and they're an awesome team. You guys should take a picture with soccer, volleyball, and golf right this is, now. This is Cause an you're all, incredible Because you're all in the time. top ten. Oh wow! Okay. It's, it's a fun time at BYU right <laughs> like, now. Like it, it's unbelievable. Yes, and no. the women's sports specifically have just been ridiculously good and let's <laughs> let's finish with this i always love to ask cross country runners this how many miles do you run a week uh f- 50 about 50 55 oh, ho, ho, 50 hum. you know yeah 50, 50 i'm not i think i'm like medium mileage i'm not high i'm, <laughs> I'm not low i'm medium 50 <laughs> miles a week that's incredible Me- medium mileage i think i drive 50 miles a week yeah <clears throat> <laughs> that's yeah, what i do that's an accomplishment <laughs> <laughs> erica it's great to talk to you let's give you some boa sports nation karma for the approaching meets and uh and your runs thank you okay, <laughs> okay looking forward to near thanksgiving weekend right yes the nationals of Terre Haute. Okay. Oh, here let's we go. go here we go BYU junior nose tackle Kyrus Tonga is an NFL prospect, and rightly so. He is a machine, a force, a force to be reckoned with on the field. But his journey to BYU, Jason, has been anything but smooth. Listen and watch this backstory about finding family and focus in this week's Deep Blue segment presented by Tim Daly Nissan. Kyrus has been fun to coach. He's a He's an awesome young man, really made strides in this last year as a vocal leader, which, you know, if you had known Kairos before, you couldn't get two words out of him. In high school, uh, my mom, it was hard for her. There's times where she would be in a shelter and uh, we couldn't we couldn't be there. So there's times where I was just I was going back and forth, like looking for a place to stay. Like every night I didn't know where I was going to go after school. My dad was never really in the picture. It was it was hard. It was a it was a rough time, and then um, my senior year, he was adopted by another family, and this is one of his best friend's family that took took him in. My mom, she basically asked him if they can take care of me, and that she she can't like uh, help me anymore. Uh, so that was hard for me. I, I just felt like uh, someone was giving up on me. She was gone from there. Going into my senior year. Um, I got into some trouble. I couldn't play football. I couldn't be around anyone. Um, I was on on house arrest. I felt like everything was just getting taken away from me. I I learned quickly um, that blessings and disguises. I got into the church. My family helped me, like, started teaching me how to pray, started teaching me how to read the scriptures. He gone through a lot at a young age, and so the fact that he was able to embrace such a wonderful family, for the Tonga family to to love him and goes to show how much just loving someone and caring for someone can really change their entire life. He's a living proof of that. Finally graduated that senior year and I was getting ready to go to Utah. And my, my pops, the, the guy that I'm with now, and we were driving and uh, I just told my dad, like, that I think I want to serve a mission. And he just like stopped the car and he's like, 
you wanna what? I was like, I wanna serve a mission. I, I didn't know what was what I was gonna get myself into, but it was just something I just felt like I needed to do. That was something my wife and I always wanted him to do was go on a mission. But at the same time, we didn't want to pressure him or force him. So I said to him, I says, well, why do you want to go on a mission? And I'll never forget what he says. He says, no, God's watched me all my life. And the least I can do is give back two years. And right then I knew it was sincere because all he wanted to do in his life was to play football. But now we understand that there's something more important than football. I left as soon as I got clear with my bishop, and I, and I went. And without the mission, I don't know where I would be. Um, I don't know if I'd be at Utah or get into trouble. But I'm here at BYU, and it's it's been it's been good for me. And the Cougars bring pressure in trouble and sacked as Tonga. The expression of gratitude is is him. He is so thankful for everything and, and can't, can't express enough how much he shows his gratitude and how grateful he is to everyone when he could easily uh, complain and quit a long time ago. Slovis to the air, gets hit, and taken down for a sack by Tonga. Having Kairos as a brother um, fills in the missing puzzle piece that we never knew we had. Even though I love Utah, um, I am a Kyra Stonga fan. That is the only player I will ever cheer for. I think he just knows that we love the youth so much, so he's kind of used to it. We joke around and say um, he's a chimpo, if you guys know Mulan. The big, the biggest guy in the whole movie, but he's the most graceful, the most loving. Looking at the pictures, like our family pictures of Kyra's not in it, it's kind of weird. We don't like looking at it because we always know that someone's missing. And so we don't really frame those pictures up because it's just, it's not our family. You know, there are people that God put in your path for a reason. When he used to talk about his struggles, I would think to myself, where was I? Where was I when all of this happened? And he would just look at me, he would say, Mom, it's okay. Because in a way, I, I knew if I had him earlier, he would not go through those struggles. Because I'm very protective over my children. And I love him as if he was naturally ours. So my heroes are, are my mom and my dad. They mean everything to me. Um, everything I am, everything I will be, just because my parents, it's been a little crazy, but I wouldn't change anything, so. What a story. Kairos Tonga. And just to give you an idea of what kind of a young man he is, um, when I was going through a personal loss at Toledo, in the midst of the game at halftime, he came up to me, and gave me a hug and said, Spencer, I'm sorry for your loss. And I just thought, who does that in the middle of a game? I mean, he's, he's that type of guy. Yeah, and this is something that we talked about on when we did the Fan Fest in Nashville. But I will forever remember Kyrus with all of his teammates that were at that Fan Fest signing autographs. It was hot. It was in the 90s, humid in May. And he got up. He noticed there was, a, there was a woman that was walking around, and he got up, went and got a, a bottle of water and took it to her, gave her a hug, and said, here, do you need this? I will never forget that, the way that he thought of her and that she was probably hot and thirsty at the yeah. time and got up, got her a bottle of water, and walked over. Didn't have to, but I will never forget that. What a stud. What a stud. The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. Get caught up in the week in Cougar Sports. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. We're about to make things better and bring in on the Deseret First Credit Union hotline former BYU quarterback, a man who helped the Cougars beat Nebraska, Boise State, Arizona, and number six, Wisconsin, among others. Tanner Mangum is with us. Tanner, welcome back to the show. How are you? 
Oh, man, it's good to be back. I'm doing well. How are you guys doing? Fantastic. And we want to get caught up with what's going on in your life. So tell us, what's the latest and greatest in the life of Tanner Mangum? The, the life of a, of a has-been. Uh, right, right now, I'm working, uh, working in marketing for Pluralsight. It's a great tech company based out of uh, Farmington with offices in South Jordan. And so I'm living in Salt Lake doing marketing, and then I'm still uh, you know, pretty active in the mental health uh, activism world, doing some speaking engagements, going around to different events and conferences, uh, and doing that, which has been good. And then, and then enjoying married life and being a dad. It's it's been a it's been a fun adventure, and just uh, enjoying the next steps of life. You know, Tanner. I mean, everybody that plays college sports goes through this at some point. When football or sports in general is is just all encompassing, and it's everything you do. How have you handled? not having that be as big a part of your life as it used to be. How, how, how difficult or how much of a transition has that been for you? Uh, it, it's been tough. It's, you know, cause it's, it's a dream that you have a, since you're a kid and you put in all this work and all this time. And then unfortunately NFL didn't work out. I got a couple of tryout invites, but didn't make it. And then the XFL went to the tryout, did well, but then didn't get drafted on the XFL draft and, and so, you know, it's it's disappointing. It's when you, when you have those those, uh, those those disappointments. But at the same time, I just try to keep perspective, and I try to remember that I, there's a lot more to me than just football. There's a lot of uh, things to offer and things to look forward to, different ventures that that I can get involved in, and uh, I just try to remember, uh, you know, what's what's to, to stay active in, in other things and, and to not solely be defined. By the sport that I do love and I have a passion for, but I just try to keep myself uh, busy and focused on, uh, on other good things. Now, without question, you are a student of the game. We know that you love football. So, how do you plan to stay involved moving forward? Yeah, well, it's a great question. I- I'm looking forward to November 9th. Going to be work, uh, you know, working as a little guest analyst with you guys uh, for the Liberty game, and then I've been. Doing some radio spots uh, on 1280 and then ESPN 960, doing some co-hosting there. And, uh, yeah, just providing some analysis, some uh, some insights, and uh, some knowledge. And, and then, uh, you know, who knows? We'll see what happens in the, in the future. But uh, for now, I'm, I'm enjoying, you know, just uh, trying to provide some, some of the, the institutional knowledge that I gained while, while uh, you know, just, just playing football my whole life and, and then all the – all the time that you spend playing football at a, at a at a university, in a way, it's kind of like a double major. You major in football, in a way, and so it's been good being able to impart some of that knowledge to uh, to the general public. Well, we're excited to have you put on the analyst hat. In fact, let's do that right now on a Friday and evaluate some quarterback play right now at BYU. Jaron Hall and Baylor Romney both seemingly will be healthy for the Utah State game. Of course, Romney quarterbacked BYU to a win over then number 14 Boise State and really shocked all of BYU Sports Nation and basically the entire nation with how the Cougars played following that USF loss. So how would you evaluate, first of all, the play of Baylor Romney in his first and at this point only start at BYU? Well, man, I, I give him an absolute A. Uh, I think he passed with, with flying colors. I, I, I was pretty vocal about it on Twitter. Uh, I, I just think that it was really impressive the way he handled that situation. To, to come in in your first start, he hasn't played a game since high school. And I saw him last year, too, so I have a unique perspective into his progression being the fifth string last year, works his way up to third string. And then in this game, in a, in a cold, wet, rainy environment against a, a pretty tough team, Goes in and, and, and handles his own, and, and he, you know, two, two touchdowns, no turnovers, managed the game well, wasn't flustered, looked calm and collected. And um, I was really proud of him. Really cool to see his progress, see his growth, and to see him handle that situation. And uh, that was great to see. And, I, and, and, it, and it, it was a win that the BYU team desperately needed. And so, you know, couldn't be happier for him and, uh, and, and his work that he put in. And uh, seeing it pay off for him is great to see. 
Tanner, I agree with you 100%. I was so impressed with what I saw out of, out of Baylor, not just in that game, but even against South Florida when he, when he had to come in when Jaron went down originally. He, it, the moment didn't look like it was too big for him. And, and obviously, BYU didn't win that game, but I, I walked away impressed and then certainly impressed with what happened against Boise State. But now it's the big question here, Tanner. So with both quarterbacks healthy, heading, presumably heading into Utah State, who do you think should start a quarterback against the Aggies? So this this is the the million dollar question, right? Right. And it's tough. And and me of all people, I understand quarterback battles and quarterback uh, uh, controversies, if you will. And I've been involved in them. I was involved in them throughout my whole career. And it's a part of the game. It's an unfortunate part of the game that only one quarterback can play because oftentimes the team has two, three uh, very capable quarterbacks. And in this case, uh, it's it's. The, you know the battle of the backups between Jaron and Baylor, who, who, who have both shown that they're capable. And so, given everything I just said about Baylor, I feel bad because even though he played so well, I truly feel that everything he did it, it wasn't anything that Jaron couldn't have done himself. And Jaron, in his performances this year, has shown that he can play, and he can make plays. I think the USF game he showed me what he can do with his feet, with his athleticism, and his decision making. And, and he had some great throws as well. That that that, that long touchdown to Dax was great. And uh, and so he's he's capable. He's a great player. And there's a reason he's been the backup. There's a reason the coaches like him and trust him. And so I think if he's healthy, you got to you got to let him roll. And and so I think I can see both sides. I can truly I can see Baylor starting. I can understand their decision if they want to keep the momentum going from the Boise State game. And there's a lot of things that we don't know as well. We, we don't see how they're performing in practice. We don't see you know, how Jaron is recovering from his concussion. But if all things being equal, if both are healthy, uh, I like Jaron. I like giving him that, that opportunity to keep rolling, to keep, uh, to keep that, um, uh, I guess, you know, build, build, off, build off of the, the body of work that he's already put together. And, and furthermore, I think if you really – Kind of make it a a fifty fifty type thing. It can affect it can affect the uh, the, the confidence of either one. If you say, "Hey, we're going to give you these reps, but then we're going to pull you and put in Baylor," if, you know, if we're going to if we're going to share, that's tough. I think you got to pick one and go with it. And so, I if if, if, if it's me, I'm going with Jaron. But it, it, but if they go with Baylor, I can understand that. And luckily, both of them have shown that they're very capable. Tanner Mangum with us on BYU Sports Nation, former BYU quarterback, talking about the current BYU quarterback situation as the Cougars prepare for Utah State, obviously on a bye week currently. Tanner, let's say that Jaron does get the start. What would you tell Baylor to help him keep perspective amidst this now out-of-the-blue quarterback battle? Well, I think it's it's the same thing you tell any backup quarterback. You tell him to prepare and to get ready and to prepare as if you're going to be the starter. Now, I've been in that situation a lot of the times. When, uh, in, you know, first of all, in 2015, when, when Taysom started, and, and then the, the very first game I had to step in. And then 2016, Taysom's back to being the starter, and I'm, and I'm kind of waiting in the wings the whole season, and then I come in against uh, you know Utah State and play in the bowl game. So you just never know when your number is going to be called, and you have to be prepared at all times. And Baylor's just, he's a solid guy. He's got a good head on his shoulders. He's got good perspective, good maturity. And, and he's not if, – if they do go with Jaron, he's going to stay ready. He's going to stay, stay poised, and he'll be ready to go if, if, if called upon. Um, but a big thing that I really want to call out is, is the play calling against Boise State was really great. It was aggressive. It was a little more attacking. It was unique. The, the, the trick plays. It was. It, it kept Boise State on their toes, and it was. It was great to see. And so I hope they can combine that type of play calling against Boise State, but also allowing Jaron to give him opportunities to run and to create plays and, and to to make make things happen with his feet. And I, and, and so I, again, I think that combination, the play calling that 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 Baylor had at his disposal, combined with Jaron's athleticism, would be a, a great combination. That, uh, that can really give BYU a lot of success. Tanner, real fast before we let you go, we were talking earlier in the show about with BYU having five regular season games remaining, the chances that BYU could run the table. What do you expect from BYU over the last five regular season games? What, well, like I said, the, 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 the win against Boise State was, was a win they desperately needed, and I think it's going to give them a lot of momentum, a lot of confidence. But that being said, Utah State is a tough opponent. They've really turned the program around these last few years, and the last, the last two seasons have really 
taking it to BYU. And so this is a big game in Logan. Uh, but I expect them to play with a lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm, and, and a lot of passion. And I, and I think the uh, obviously the Utah State and San Diego State games will provide some tough challenges. And hopefully those UMass, Idaho State, uh, Liberty games, uh, we, play, we like to think that those are those are uh, uh, you know some, some some winnable, very winnable games. And so luckily that that gets them to a bowl game. And I, and I know that's what they're playing for. They're playing uh, to finish strong, to get to a bowl game, to uh, to, to build that momentum, and then to to to, to win out. And uh, it's, it's going to be a challenge, but I, it, it's doable if if they play with the uh, the right amount of intensity, the right amount of passion, and of course execution. It's it's doable. It's, it's it'll be a tough challenge, but I think it's possible. Tanner, great to talk with you on BYU Sports Nation. Look forward to you hanging out with us on Countdown to Kickoff during the Liberty game and uh, whatever else the future holds, man. Thanks. Hey, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. The best of BYU Sports Nation collects our favorite conversations and brings them to you every Saturday. It's time, Jerem, that we track BYU football opponents and what in the world's going on with all of them. Let's start with that team out of Ogden. Utah State beat Nevada 36-10, moving to 4-2 on the season. Gerald brightly beams our father's mercy, rest for 126 yards and two touchdowns in the win. The Aggies are a four-point underdog at the Air Force this week and BYU next week. I want the Aggies to win this game. I want them to have some juice. Five and two. Five and two. Yeah. Really good. You Logan, betcha. let's go. Tip some cows. Let's go. Liberty, Liberty, Liberty moves to five and two on five the season. Five and two? The most empty five and two record of any team in college football. <laughs> They've won five straight. That's two, impressive. Two FCS. They most recently took down the powerhouse Maine, 59-44. Buckshot Calvert did throw for five touchdowns in that win. The Flames traveled to face Rutgers. Oh, another P5 uh, a, powerhouse. A power five power on Saturday. And guess what? They'll earn a million dollars to play this game against Rutgers. I'll go lose to them for a million bucks. Idaho State. Dude, Liberty's a seven-point favorite in that game. And they're going to get a million bucks on top of it. How bad is Rutgers? Jeez. Idaho State lost 45-21 to rival Idaho. The three and four Bengals play Southern Utah and Cedar City this week. UMass. Yikes. Falls to 1-6 and six with a loss at Louisiana Tech, 69-21. to 21. Nice. The Minutemen will enjoy a much-needed bye week before taking on UConn. San Diego State is 6-1 and one and 3 out of the 8 people. What? 10-point win over San Jose State at UNLV this week. You and I looked at the San Diego State schedule last week. They have a good defense. They're winning close margins against OK teams. Not much offense I there. don't think... I think they're good. I don't think they're very good. Like six and one feels like you're very good. There's a real chance that San Diego State could be ten and one when BYU plays. That'd be nuts. If you're ten and one, you're very good, regardless of who, you, like who you play in that situation. I still think you're very good if you're ten and one. They beat a, they beat a, an okay Wyoming team. They've got to make a tricky uh, visit to I, Hawaii. You know, I just when we talk about the Mountain West teams like that, I'm just like, ugh. I just feel weird because I'm like, oh, old news, ex girlfriends. <laughs> You know what I mean? That's what it feels like. Oh, why are we talking about that? I would love but for San Diego State to be 10-1 and one and ranked in the top 20 when BYU plays them. <laughs> top 20? Yeah. San that Diego would be State. a fifth-ranked opponent for BYU this season. That would be awesome. <laughs> Five-ranked opponents if BYU goes 3-2 and two or something. Oh, my now, goodness. Now, San Diego State has won 39 games the last four years. That's pretty stinking good. All right. Hey, Utah winning a lot of games as well. The team up north, number Yay, 12 in the AP them. poll after a 21-3 win against Arizona State. The 6-1 and one Utes host Cal this week. Last I saw, that's, they were that, a... That's, that's enough Utah talk. 19-point favorite against blah, the blah, blah, Who cares? Tennessee lost 35-13 against Alabama. Vols are... Vols. Vols. I have Vols in my backyard. 2-5 and five now with South Carolina this week. I hope they beat South Carolina. <laughs> Seriously, I am a Tennessee fan the rest of the way. I would love to see Jeremy Pruitt win some games and have his seat a little less uh, well, cool cool down, if you will. I don't care. USC takes down Arizona 41-14. Keaton Slovis and Michael Pittman Jr. connected on two touchdowns on that win. SC now 4-3. and three. They travel to Colorado for a Friday night Pac-12 showdown this week. Washington lost 35-31 to number 12 Oregon 
at home, losing for a second time in the last three weeks. We thought Washington would be this really, really good team. They're five and three. They have a bye week before Utah. If they lose to Utah, five and four? Whoa. Holy Toledo, what is going on with the Rockets? They lost their second straight game, 52 to 14 to Ball State. Boom goes the dynamite. Oh, the Rockets, four and three, and will host Eastern Michigan this week at the Glass Bowl. South Florida put up a field goal against Ken Niamatololo and Navy in a 35 3 loss. They're three and four. They play at ECU this week. They stink. <laughs> oh, that one. That one really, really stinks. Oh. Like we care about, like, strength of schedule and RPI for the opponent. Oh. Like it's going to help BYU get into a different bowl game or something. Hey, by the way, Brett McMurphy, <laughs> friend of the program, projecting the Cougars to face 6 and 1 Memphis put in the up. Hawaii Bowl. Let's go. As a possible 13th opponent, uh, the Tigers, by the way, beat Tulane 47-17 this week. They'll take on 2-5 and five Tulsa this week. Memphis, whoever comes out of the American, Navy, they're 5-1. and one. Memphis, 6-1. and one. UCF, 5-2. and two. Like all three of those opponents I've seen projected against BYU and the Hawaii Bowl, they're all pretty stinking good teams. Where's the Hawaii Bowl in the AAC hierarchy? I have no idea. I would think it's not that high, right? I don't probably, know, but... Is BYU getting, like, the fourth or fifth best like AAC thir- third team or, or fourth, something? Third or fourth. Well, ESPN can go, like, after the 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 obligated, like, highest bowl game, then it kind of kind of becomes just like, well, what's the best matchup? What's going to get the most eyeballs? Yeah. Well, let's, let's see who it is. <laughs> I like uh, bowl projections as much as I like RPI. <laughs> The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. Hey, you've been waiting. Top five wins in the Kalani Satake era. Where does Boise State rank in that top five? We put together the list presented by BYU Food to Go, the MVP of your next event. Let's Count it down, starting at number five. And we go to Idaho, the Potato Bowl. Western Michigan at number five because of when this game happened, the offseason that set up, and it proved it. Hey, Zach Wilson is a gamer. He's the guy. BYU finishes with a winning record because of this win. Yeah, this was a, this was a nice way to end the season. Zach Wilson goes perfect 18 for 18. BYU actually trailed at the half of this game. It's major adjustments. Comes down the second half. Boom, seven-yarder. To Aleva Hifo, BYU was on a tear in this game. 42 unanswered points. That's incredible. Great, great win to end the season. No one cared that it was Western Michigan. Just a reminder about that. All right, in at number four, Jeremy, what do we have? At Michigan State 2016, this was a Michigan State team that had gone to the college football semifinal the year before. BYU goes there with Taysom Hill and Jamal Williams, and bang, 17 point win against Sparty. That was a big win. Michigan State ended up stinking. Four wins, three wins. They were two and one when BYU beat them. But you go there, Big Ten, Michigan State, that's a big win. That's a big win. That's like the Tennessee win this year, right? But even more because Michigan State had gone to the college football playoff. Yes, defending Big Ten champions for crying out loud. Right. At number three, this season, BYU at home against USC. Peyton Wilgar. Huge interception to kick things off and really get the momentum rolling in BYU's favor, setting up Zach Wilson and company for the first real home signature win for Kalani Satake. This was a big win. At this point, BYU's 2-1. and one. It's a team with like 44 stars. BYU has like three or something. This was an upset. This was Sky Cam. This was a field storm. This was awesome. Let's move to number two, Boise State 2019. We think the win BYU just had was really big in terms of what it means for BYU season, Kalani Satake, and so on. A 28-25 upset win over number 14, Boise State, which, by the way, I believe is the biggest uh, win in terms of a ranking, top 14 and in, since 97. Oh, yeah. At home. How there's, about that? There's a real argument that this could eventually be the top win, depending on where Boise State finishes this season. We'll see, this if, could be the only loss the Broncos if, have. If they're in a New Year's Six, you can make that this argument, This would right? be the number one. Yeah. As it stands, number one is, rewind to 2018, at Wisconsin. Moroni Laulapututau from a Levihifo trick play. That's the image. BYU out physical the Badgers in Camp Randall 24-21. So good. This win was huge. Top 10 win, 41 game home, non-conference win streak for Wisconsin. And BYU takes down the bet. Oh, Squally Canada was fantastic. BYU gets it done. Gets a top 10 team on the road. (laughs) 
It's the BYU Sports Nation stat of the day. Our next guest, Elise Flake of BYU Women's Soccer, has scored more goals, 14, by her lonesome than 67 teams in Division I soccer. That is is what we call domination. Elise, welcome to Studio B. Again, nice. with uh, quite the stat of the day. How do, you, how do you feel about that, outscoring by yourself 67 teams? Kind of a cool stat. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, very, that's downplaying it. You know, it's also cool. Black eye. Like, it's like you, battle. You've got battles. You want to explain what happened? Yeah, we were playing Portland the other day, and I kind of got taken out by one of the girls. She just, like, headed my face. So okay. went down and had to come out, but got a cool scar from me. People it, so. don't understand how physical and how brutal soccer can be. <laughs> like, unless you played it at a high level. Like, it, it is a very physical sport. Okay, so in the moment, you got to play on. What's going through your mind when your face is numb? <laughs> it was actually stop the play. I was on the ground for a few seconds, but um, being, like, sent a long ball, and so I, like, turned to go get it, and then... The girl was there instead. So well, they look awesome. It just looks like <laughs> eye black mostly. So, <laughs> so all right, let's let's take this a little bit uh, a little bit deeper. So your career high in goals is fourteen. You did that last year. Now you have fourteen already this year. Why do you think you've had so much success scoring so far this season? I think the biggest thing is just our team has been dominant in every game, and so it makes it a lot easier for me. I'm getting the ball more, uh, more opportunities, and so I think it's just a team effort of keeping the ball, and we have uh, majority of the possession most games, and so that's been super helpful. There was this point a couple of seasons ago when BYU was really struggling to score goals, and the team was looking for that goal scorer, and then something clicked, and you became that person. What, what changed to help you kind of go to that level of, okay, I'm, I'm the goal scorer? Yeah, I think just comes with confidence. And once I started scoring a few more goals, I kind of gained that confidence. And so that's been super helpful over the last couple of years. Um, also, one thing that's cool about our team this year is we have tons of goal scorers. It's not just me who has lots of goals. Like other people, Kayla and others, I mean, we have 14 goal scorers, which is pretty crazy already this season. And so that's been a huge part of it. Not just me, but everyone's scoring more goals. Well, so. and you and I have actually talked about this. I think that's one of the things that's most impressive about this team. It does not matter if it's somebody in the starting 11, if it's somebody that comes off the bench, plays three or four minutes. Everybody's walking in very confident and with the ability to score. The, the level of play does not drop with a substitution. Yeah, for sure. That's been huge this year. Elise Flake of BYU Women's Soccer with us on BYU Sports Nation. You've got that number four ranking in front of your team. How much uh, attention do you give to that ranking compared to something like RPI and positioning for the NCAA tournament? Yeah, we try not to think about rankings too much. Um, It is super cool, though. Like We're grateful for um, the opportunities we've had that we're there right now. Um, And Jen... um, has us like stop and think and appreciate what we've done and what we've accomplished. And so that's big, but we also don't think about the rankings a ton. Like we just take it game by game and we know that we need to get better every game in preparation for the tournament. So, you know, we've talked uh, about the things that kind of impresses us about watching this. What impresses you most about your team? I think the coolest stat that we've had this year is that we have 11 shutouts and only six goals against. I think that is one of the coolest things that our defense has just been incredible. So. You have the nickname Flake and Bake, which is brought up often <laughs> by Carla Swenson Haslam, who calls games with myself and, and Jerem on BYU TV. What do you think of Flake and Bake as your nickname? <laughs> I think it's funny. Carla actually started that my freshman year. I remember one time we were playing at Gonzaga, and it was a fun game. And I didn't get a ton of time freshman year, but um, Carla was like my biggest fan. She was super awesome. Um, she like slipped a note into my coat pocket before I went in. She's like, Flake and Bake, go show them what's up or something. And so that was like the first time that I had really heard about it. But then she's been saying it ever since. So I think it's fun. But <laughs> <laughs> So now you obviously obviously have many more games and we're hoping a lot of games left in this season but as a senior have you sort of maybe taken note more of of what's going on have you appreciated things a little bit more this year as a senior yeah for sure I've had a lot of time to reflect the last few games as it's kind of as regular seasons coming to an end it's kind of crazy that I've I'm almost done, you know? Um, But I think the biggest thing for me is just ending on a high note, taking my team as far as we can go and just kind of enjoying every moment that we have this season. So We could spend the next hour talking about how incredible BYU women's soccer has been, (laughs) and and then some. But, I mean, just take it from us. Like, it's very impressive, really fun to watch. Congratulations on your success thus far. And let's give you some BYU Sports Nation karma to uh, keep it rolling. I know that this soccer team (laughs) believes in the karma. We do. I mean, some weird things have happened. (laughs) But maybe they're not so weird. So, Has she signed our new flag? Have you, have you signed the new flag? The new one? Okay, oh. okay we've got to get you to sign the new one. Let's get Elise to sign the new flag on her way out. Great to talk to you, Elise. Thanks for coming in. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for having me. You got it. 14 right. goals. Yeah, more four. than 67 teams. <laughs> That's such a great stat.
the best of BYU Sports Nation. We'll be right back. Rise and shout for the trending topics of the week here on the best of BYU Sports Nation. A third string quarterback, fourth string running back, extremely (laughs) banged up offensive line. BYU just lost to a bad USF team in Tampa, Uh, and here comes 14th ranked and undefeated Boise State into Provo. Jerem, how did BYU beat the Broncos of Boise State? I think there was a certain level of desperation that caused change uh, with the coaching staff, uh, had an increased sense of urgency, had uh, nuance, uh, exotic defense. We saw Diane Gunwilk in the backfield a lot. That's, he's good. When Just, has BYU run multiple safety blitzes? That was awesome. They moved him to safety, by the way, not corner. Uh, offensively, some creativity that we saw, right, with the uh, flea flickers and a fourth and one and a very aggressive call at the end of the game on the 34. To me, it was great coaching. Great coaching won this game for BYU because if you stack the personnel up, that BYU used against Boise State. And yes, Boise State used Chase Cord, their backup quarterback. Ah, BYU used its third string walk on Baylor Romney. Fourth string running back in Sione Fino, as you mentioned. The leading tackler is a guy that was playing running back earlier this season, like <laughs> almost earlier this month, you know, like a month ago. Tyler Algier, nine solo tackles. O line missing four of its top seven. The undefeated number four team in, team in the country who had won seven of nine against BYU. BYU's coming off two losses. That they should have won, and they win this game because of good coaching. Remember, everyone wanted uh, halftime adjustments. Adjust. How is 21 nothing in the third quarter sound? Because that's what BYU did, which brings us to our stat of the day. It's the BYU Sports Nation stat of the day. Not only does BYU score 21 points, they scored on 12 plays in the third quarter. A turnover will do that from Jackson Kafusi. I just loved what this BYU coaching staff did. They adjusted before the game. They adjusted in the game. And BYU beat Boise State. I mean, BYU has work to do in fourth quarters. They've been outscored 42 nothing in the last three games. But BYU took care of business, got aggressive at the end, and won. I'm just so happy for BYU because, I mean, people are, people are calling for Kalani Satake's job after this. And now, now that that ceases and BYU has an opportunity and some confidence going into a pocket. Just best case scenario here. It's as simple as this, Jerem. BYU just needs a crazy pregame rainstorm (laughs) to set the mood before they knock off a top 15 team at home. Okay. It was insane. You guys were out in the elements (laughs) for the pregame. I was nice and warm in the control room. It was crazy, crazy. And then during the game, it like let up quite a bit. So remember 2013, BYU comes off a gut punch of a loss at Virginia to a bad Virginia team. Yes, they didn't have Brooklyn at all. And in comes Texas at number 15, riding high after they had blown out some lowly team in their home stadium. I think it was North Texas at the time, 55-7. Yes, yes. And I think fans were kind of like, I don't know what to expect. I kind of got the same impression of this game as well, where it's, oh, man, BYU just lost to a bad USF team. Maybe this was a trap game of sorts for Boise State, where they see BYU lose at USF. They're six and zero, and they're thinking, "Oh man, we can we can probably get away with just kind of like going through the motions." BYU, to their credit, with the coaching staff and all their position changes, were meticulously prepared for Boise State. They were so well prepared. This was the best coaching job by BYU's staff this year, and it's not I, not close. I know USC was a great win. BYU still had Zach Wilson. They still had Tyson Williams, and they were still healthy for the most part. This is with Baylor Romney, Sione Finau, and three starting offensive linemen out of the game. Blake Freeland played a lot of right tackle. He had not played in a college game ever. This was his first game. BYU got the ball to their stud, Matt Bushman. He went over 100 yards for the first time. Multi- Two touchdowns for the first time. Finally! What took so long? Okay. He's a junior. So everything that BYU fans have been clamoring for, it happened. Pressure on the quarterback. It happened. These unique blitzes, it all happened. Only two sacks, but there was pressure. BYU uh, mixed it up, made Boise State see, see some things they hadn't seen all year. That felt like a Kalani Sataki-led defense. You know what I mean? He's the head coach that felt like, and BYU's been, had, had a good defense, don't get me wrong, the last three years. That felt like what we've wanted to see from BYU's defense. Yeah. How did BYU do it? With meticulous preparation. Meticulousness. Urgency. 
maybe even some desperation in that yeah. moment. If you're not desperate at uh, two and four oh. with Boise State coming in, then don't play the game. How satisfying of a victory against so a rival at home. I'm shocked that BYU won this game. It's uh, given the circumstances. Stuart Mandel of The Athletic posted a mailbag yesterday, and in it mentioned BYU. Here we go. I understand why BYU prefers independence to being in the Mountain West, much like Notre Dame's commitment to its national fan base, the exposure from BYU's ESPN deal, and the flexibility of its schedule allows the religious-based school to engage with LDS members far from Utah. Okay, Stu. But from a purely football standpoint, it's not ideal. You see a lot of BYU on TV early in the season when it's playing USC and Tennessee, but as soon as the Cougars lose a couple of games, they fall off the grid. The Boise State game was a notable exception. Rather than competing for a conference championship and possibly a New Year's Six Bowl, their season ends anticlimactically and with a meh November schedule followed by whatever leftover bowl has an opening. If BYU was in the Mountain West, it could still play high-profile non-conference games as Power 5 teams gladly schedule home and homes with the Cougars. They'd probably be on ABC ESPN a couple of weeks less, but every game would be nationally televised somewhere. And who's to say even this team, which even shorthanded, showed it can beat arguably the Mountain West's best team, wouldn't still be in the hunt for a trophy? End quote. Spencer, is Stuart Mandel wrong? Stuart Mandel's logic and takes here are mostly fair. He just explained the entire 2018 BYU season, by the way. Last year, beating Wisconsin, beating Arizona, then you lose a couple of games, and BYU had a meh. November schedule. Didn't he explain 2019? Well, not too? necessarily. I mean, being lost in the ethos of independence once you lose three games is not fun or competitive as it is being in a conference. The conference title battle will always win out. That will always be more interesting and more intriguing. He did say BYU has an irrelevant November schedule, which I don't agree with this year. BYU plays at Utah State November 2nd. Then they could potentially match up against a ranked San Diego State team on the final Saturday in November. That's different than last year. Those are unranked group of five teams. So I, I see what he's saying. I, yeah. I get it. I felt like it was more about the 2018 than it is about potentially what could be at the end of 2019. If I feel Diego like he's State talking is, about this year. If San Diego right? State is ranked, then... Well, then, then, then it will become a more relevant there's game. There's some relevance in November. And I think playing Utah State in November is also a relevant Not to a national game. game. Yeah. Okay? But, so, his points are fair. BYU is... So close, however, to a potential major shift in the college football landscape. It doesn't make sense to move right now. It's, that's like waiting in the grocery store in the express lane, and you get all the way almost to the front, and then you peer out of the right side of your eye, and you're like, oh, maybe that line over there is a little bit shorter. And then you get out of that line, and only to find out that the line you just went to get into is really slow behind this one super long customer, and now the express line is moving fast. We don't know that the check stand's open or that, they're, or that the machine's on. You know what I mean? Oh, <laughs> like, yes. Like, we don't but know that. The, the point is, it's, it doesn't make sense. BYU's waited this long. There's going to be a major shift on the college football landscape, we think, there could be. in 2023, 2024, because of a couple of reasons. The TV contract being renegotiated with uh, most of the Power Five conferences, and then the equal pay for play movement that is happening in California and apparently is going to happen in Florida and some other states. How will that paying amateur athletes situation affect conference shakeup? It, it does BYU no good to move now. Like, why, why move now so you can play for two years and, or three years in the Mountain West and hope to be the best of G5, but then you're locked in and you got to pay a bunch of fines to get out of games you've already scheduled as an independent? It, just wait it out till 2024, and then if it doesn't happen, Power 5 invite doesn't happen, then go to a G5. Then reacclimate with a Group of 5 conference. It's just the timing of it all is not right. His takes are fair, but the timing is not right for BYU to move now. I don't think he's saying move. He's just saying, well, what if, right? Um, I think it depends on what you value. What do you value? Do you value on the field performance and accomplishment? Or do you value things off the field? I think currently BYU values things more off the field than on right now. Because why is BYU independent? It's to play on ESPN. It's to have that connection, to have better games, a better schedule, to have more money, and they do, than any other group of five conference. BYU gets all its bowl money, all of its TV money, right? It's a nice situation. If BYU can continue to perform well on the field. Now, when BYU went Indy, they had won 10-plus games and finished ranked in four of the previous five years. Since then, BYU has done that one time in eight 
now nine seasons. I, th- I think it just matters about what you care about the most. I care a lot about BYU's performance on the field. I think BYU Athletics does too. I, ju- I just think BYU has shown that it's, these schedules are, are too tough to get to 10-plus wins at this point. Until BYU does it consistently, it's too tough, right? So off the field, money, exposure, K to the fan base, that's all been fun. I think we can all agree it's been awesome to see BYU travel, win some big games, unfortunately lose some big games and some other games, not really get over that 10-win hump. But I, it would be fun, right, to compete for a conference championship, to have a shot at a New Year's Six. And beating Boise State kind of reemphasizes that idea of, guess what? BYU would be a competitive team and perhaps win occasionally a group of five conference championship. Do you want that or not? I think we all want something better than the Mountain West. And uh, that's the ex-girlfriend that we don't want to, like, acknowledge, right? But it, AAC, Mountain West, I'm with you. Wait until – he's not saying move, and nor am I. But I think independence can work if BYU is scheduled a little more uh, fairly to what it does, which is like three or four power fives, not four in a row or five plus or that kind of thing. BYU needs to beat Toledo and USF before they can seriously consider winning a group of five conference and being the best G5 team. Well, I disagree because BYU would not play three or four power fives in a row at the beginning of the season. No, not, no, that was exact, well, you that's know what probably I mean? well, exactly what would happen if they were in a G5. They, they'd load up the front schedule and then they'd get into their conference. No, they do what they did before, which is play like one or two power fives in an FCS team. And, uh, you know, one would be Utah. Utah State would be in league, right? You'd play an FCS team, maybe one over power five. You would not get beat up. And and if you you could uh, go full Mountain West later, I think BYU would be in a better position to win ten plus games if they were in a Mountain West. I'm not saying go to a Mountain West conference. I'm just saying let's just look at what it could be like. Just wait it out. As we move from football to basketball, CBS Sports, as we just reported, released their list of the top 101 collegiate basketball players. Yoli Childs in at number 18 on that list. And just above him, literally one spot, Gonzaga's Killian Tilly, who was a guy that considered going to the NBA but has worked through some injuries, and now he's back at Gonzaga, and apparently they're beating up on Michigan State in (laughs) closed scrimmages. So holy cow. Jason, with Killian Tilly at 17, Yoli Childs at 18, do you still think Yoli Childs is the best overall player in the West Coast Conference? He certainly can be. And here's the other thing. I'm really glad that he gets the entire conference schedule to prove that. That the the needless suspension that he has to sit out the first nine games is not going to impact conference play. He'll still have a couple of games in non-conference before WCC play begins. So I love the fact that he's going to have the entire WCC schedule to be able to prove whether or not he is the best. This is, this is the way I look at it. Certainly, Yoli, Killian, Tilly, those are the two. I think there's three people you can probably put in the mix. Jordan Ford, I think, is the other one from St. Mary's. I think those are the three that are probably vying for that distinction of best player in the conference. All three are going to be the primary guy. Here's the thing with Tilly. He's coming, off, he's coming off multiple surgeries. Missed half of the year last year. Had another surgery in the offseason. So this is a guy... If he can get back to full strength and get back, he's obviously really, really good. If he's not, that certainly increases Yoli's chances of being the player of the year. If, and here's the other part. If Yoli can be the defensive player that he's talked about, that that's one of the aspects of his game that he wants to improve the most, if he can add the defensive numbers to what he already does offensively and how important he is to BYU, I think he's got a pretty good chance. Right now it's Killian Tilly. Because we're assuming full health. And that's taking nothing away from the player that Yoli Childs is or Jordan Ford, for that matter. There are some outstanding individual players in the West Coast Conference. But come on, let's be real to the situation. The NBA scouts see it. They made it clear. Killian Tilly is a guy that they expect to play at the next level, at the highest level. Here's the thing that he has on Yoli Childs. His outside range is more developed than Yoli Childs. Killian Tilly is a dead-eye shooter from the three-point line at 6'10". Yes, the 6'10 Frenchman has outstanding touch from the outside. He's got a more developed outside game. So it'll be interesting to see how that game compares from Yoli Childs when Yoli's able to finally get on the floor and we see him against the University of Utah. But right now, because Tilly has that NBA range then he's the better NBA prospect. Does that mean he's a better collegiate basketball player? I I still think so at this point, but to your 
to what you were saying, the health of Tilly is the concern. If he's not fully recovered and his foot's still bothering him, then it's Yoli Childs. It's Yoli. And I, I, I'm putting this out there maybe to put a chip on Yoli's shoulder. Like, being, being second best at killing Tilly is, is not disrespectful. Like, Tilly is a legit NBA guy. I think he's the best right now, assuming full health because he's got the range. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with you. I, I, but I like the fact that Yoli is going into this season with a chip on his shoulder. He, you don't need to give him a chip on the shoulder. He already has that based off of what happened in the offseason and coming back in and working on it. And like I said, I love his determination to work on the defensive end. We know how good this guy is on the offensive end. Yeah, Tilly's a great passer too, but – if Yoli Childs can do what he said he wanted to do last year and be the West Coast Conference Defensive yeah. Player of the Year, then he probably is the best player in the West Coast Conference to complement his really, really polished offensive skill set. Whether you have the best or the second best, and it's usually and it's probably like a one and a one A, you know your team's going to be pretty good regardless. Yeah, key for Childs to be the best defense. Yep. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. Hear what the coaches, athletes, and experts have to say. Here's another great interview from the week on the best of BYU Sports Nation. It's the BYU Sports Nation stat of the day. BYU junior tight end Matt Bushman had his first 100-yard receiving game and first multi-touchdown game all against Boise State and a monumental win in Provo over the then 14th ranked Broncos. Matt, why did it take two and a half years to get this? I'm not, I, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell you. It but. took it took way too long, but it happened, which was awesome. Um, are, are you have you come down from the high of that win? That was a big win. Yeah, I mean, we watched the film on Monday. Coaches always say once we watch the film and everything, just to forget about it, get ready for the next uh, next game. So it definitely felt good. Get that win. Get everyone happy again. Get everyone motivated. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can get the second half of the season rolling. What was different about the preparation that led to different execution against Boise State that we didn't see the previous two games? Um, Just the decision, I think, to be more aggressive. Uh, We had, I mean, even though we had a lot of injuries, offensive line, we had some new guys starting on the offensive line, uh, obviously a new quarterback. We still weren't uh, weren't worried that we couldn't, like, be aggressive. I mean, it was one of the weirdest weather situations also to throw the ball, but we were still slinging it, and taking shots when uh, people weren't expecting us to. So just that aggressiveness. You have your first 100-yard game and two-touchdown game after the deluge Mm -hmm. pregame, right? When you came out and warmed up, did you think, oh, this is going to be a long night? Because that was weird, right? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, a lot of us were running around. We had the normal gloves on. The balls were soaking wet. We were like, holy cow, this is going to be an interesting one. I'm definitely going to have 100 yards tonight. (laughs) (laughs) I was ready to run every single play. Um, But no, I mean, we... We weren't worried. We just decided to have fun with it and just enjoy the experience. Matt Bushman with us on BYU Sports Nation. Matt, you and I talked after the game against USF in Tampa, and there were some understandable frustrations about a lot of things. But sometimes adversity can kind of bring this rise from the ashes mentality. What changed mentally for you and your team after what felt like rock bottom to then beating Boise State? Well, I feel like when you come off of a – I mean, that was our third game losing. Everyone is frustrated. Everyone wants to find solutions. Um, everyone's just, just, you're just angry. You just want to win. And, I mean, those were games that we, I mean, Toledo and USF were games that we definitely could have won and should have won. And then I think it just kind of showed the the teams, um, the culture that we have, just, okay, I feel like a lot of a lot of teams are like, okay, we're done for, the season's over. Let's just forget about it. Let's let's not prepare. Let's we're playing an undefeated Boise State team, but instead of having that mentality, we were just like, all right, let's do this thing. This is a rival. This is a this is a big this is a big time game, and this is a big time win that we could have. So just it just shows the that we didn't give up. We're we're not even though we had lost those games, we're not worried. We still had a lot of football to play, and uh, we're excited for the rest of the season. How do you justify the, the wins with the losses? Because it's like, wait, these are three really good wins, and then there's some weird losses in there. So how do you kind of balance and avoid the uh, kind of two-faced nature of what the season has been so far? 
yeah, it's been really weird. It's like, how are we, how are we winning these games? But how the heck are we also losing to some of these teams? Um, and not to talk bad about them. I mean, they, they came out to play and they, they beat us, but I think it just shows that we have potential and if we prepare the right way and we, we come out with uh, the, the energy and excitement that we can have. And if we just play aggressive on offense and defense, um, we can, we can play with anyone. Um, when we don't, turn the ball over a lot, it shows that we win. Zero and, turnovers and all yeah. three wins, right? And when our defense gets turnovers, that really helps us too. So those are some big things that we should really focus on. How do you maintain the momentum through a bye week, knowing that another rival who has beaten BYU two times in a row and three out of the last five awaits on their home field? Well, I just think we just kind of have to have that same mentality that we did coming up against Boise. They're, Utah State's a really good team. They, they're really confident. Their quarterback is one of the best in the country, and he's not going to shy away from any opponent. So we have to expect their offense to score points, and that just shows that our offense has to be just as aggressive, if not more, so that we can compete with these guys and uh, just take shots. And have, I mean, we're all excited. Um, there's that wagon wheel tradition. We want that wagon wheel back at BYU, and um, no one on the team is, is going to shy away from this one. It's heavy. I'm looking forward to you guys lifting that up. It's really heavy. We had it in here a couple of years ago. I was like shocked by the uh, by the weight there. What was Baylor Romney like on the sidelines and on the field? Because it seems like this guy, in a good way, doesn't have a pulse sometimes, where he's just like very in the moment, right? Yeah, I mean, he's very mild mannered, but when he, you could just see the excitement that he had. I mean, yeah, there's going to be nerves. He was in, like I said, the weather was crazy. He was probably thinking, like, how the heck am I going to throw this football to, to my guys? <laughs> But we all trusted him, and yeah, I think you can be nervous if it's your first college start. You can be nervous in any football game, but you just have to let those nerves drive you in the right direction and kind of push you to be better, and I think he did that. He, he stepped up to the, to the occasion and, and did really well. So yeah, he's not going to be a super cocky, rah-rah type guy, but he still demands what a quarterback needs, and he has those qualities, so... Um, yeah, we really like him at, at quarterback. I want to talk about some national attention that you're getting here in just a moment, but let's follow up with the Baylor-Romney conversation. What's the challenge like of preparing to play with a quarterback that at this point you're not really sure who it's going to be? Is it going to be Baylor-Romney or is it going to be Jaron Hall, knowing that Utah State awaits? I think just some things you're all off season. You don't really know. I mean, you kind of expect – we kind of expected to have Zach at quarterback, and you're trying to build that chemistry with him and – and just the timing of routes and just get him that trust. And I think that was built up with a lot of the receivers, but injuries happen. We have, we've had three different quarterbacks this season. And once the new guys come in, the, the timing is just a little off. The chemistry is a little off. Um, so you just have to work really hard on, on getting those routes down and practice just so that he, can, he knows where we're going to be in certain situations. And uh, the biggest thing for tight ends and receivers is just to – get as open as we can for him so he can he can throw the ball up. So if that timing isn't perfect, there's still going to be room for us to to make the play and come down with the catch. And the timing was perfect on two passes uh, to you. Let's talk through both those. First, the fourth and one. So when you get that play call, at what point in that play do you realize this is going to work? I think from the start, once we, once we installed that play, um, I don't know if it was ex- just from Boise State, but they – they actually, we got that play from them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of funny that we kind of reversed roles with them. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Boise State. Stated Boise State. But once we saw, like, a fourth and short situation, the defense is going to be super condensed and their, their safeties are going to play, like, super low. So I just knew once I saw them line up like that, I mean, our whole team was super excited um, about it. We weren't really nervous, worried that it wasn't going to ha- wasn't going to work. So once I just saw, I like faked that little run, and they they faked the fumble pretty well. Um, I just saw green grass and no one around me, so I almost celebrated a little too early. <laughs> you did lift the ball like <laughs> yeah. the three, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I kind of had that. I've watched videos of those players that drop the ball at the at the one, and they return it for a touchdown. So I was like, okay, I can't, I can't celebrate yet. <laughs> um, there's a, there's just a lot of excitement. So yeah. Yeah. and then the thirty nine yarder. So that's a that's a reverse pass. Mm-hmm. That. 
that ball was a little low. You had to kind of come back and get it, but it worked, right? Yeah, I mean, those those type of plays, the ball's in the air for so long. You know there's no one around you, so it's like if you drop it, you are, you're done for. <laughs> um, it's going to be one of the most embarrassing plays. So <laughs> you just have to have that extra focus. And I didn't want to catch it with my body or, like, fall to the ground because I knew that number 28 was running after me. So I just tried to grab it with my fingertips and start running as fast as I could. And... They, play, and, they, they worked. And then you land, and you just kind of linger for a second. Oh, you, shook it, you, you just took it in. That was fun. I had to take it in. Yeah. I was in the mud. Like, somehow there was just mud at the side of the, <laughs> side of the end zone. Just laid in it for a minute. That was awesome. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. Man, we'll finish with this. Uh, John Mackey, national tight end of the week. What does a recognition like that mean to you? Um, it's, it's cool recognition, but for me it's like, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just focused on trying to get better each week, trying to – Help my help this team win and um, win out the rest of the season. So, I think a lot of players on the team is like recognition. It's it's cool and everything, but you want to have winning seasons and you want to. I mean, right now we want to make it to a bowl game, so that's our that's our main focus. Yeah. You also won the BYUSN National Tight End of the Week, so yeah. congratulations! Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Congrats. Yeah. Bigger this, honor. This just in. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, let's give you some karma moving forward. Thanks for coming in, man. We'll be right back with more of the best of BYU Sports Nation. The best of BYU Sports Nation collects our favorite conversations and brings them to you every Saturday. We're about to make it a trio on the desk in Studio B with our favorite uncle, Blaine Fowler, dual threat analyst, national champion up, quarterback. Blaine. Blaine Big day for you ahead, and a big day to talk about winning. Number 16, getting oh, it done. Oh, it's so, yeah. Hey, was that nice to see 16 representing out there at quarterback? It had so, been a minute. It was fun. So, And I'm not saying 16 hasn't represented because I felt like Sione represented 16 well <laughs> the last couple <laughs> On years. On the defensive side, and, and, yes. And, and Ronnie Jenkins, like I would always tell Ronnie, hey, one six. Like, I did the same thing with Sione last year. Like before the games when I'd see him, I'd go, hey. One six, and he's like, I got you. You know, like, hey, I know this is your number. I'm going to represent. And I would say the same thing to Ronnie when he was playing Jenks. I'm like, Ronnie, that one six means something. He'd be like, I know, I got you, man. Yeah, it's yeah. good. So the guys, there's been some really good guys that have worn that number, right? Yeah, absolutely. Not, inclu- not me, but there have been some good guys <laughs> since then. There have been some really good guys. Hey, you won a national championship and played in the national championship. We'll take, we'll take that. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and one six, my favorite one six was Kellen wore that. Gavin wore part of the time, and then he finished up his 27. But, you know, Kellen was out there running around in 1-6. That, that made my heart feel good. Let's talk about the extra savory and sweet 16 of the moment. Baylor Romney right now coming off that very impressive performance in a win against Boise State. Did he do enough to create a quandary where the coaches are saying, maybe we should start Baylor Romney at Utah State, or is Jaron Hall still the guy in Logan? Well, I think he did enough for the coaches to go, you know what? We watched him on the prep team, and we knew he was good coming out of high school. What people are forgetting, when they come up to me this weekend, they go, a walk-on guy. And I'm like, he was a scholarship athlete at Nevada who's had some really good quarterbacks and chose to go on a mission and then walk on here. So he certainly had the skill set coming out of high school to be a Division I scholarship quarterback. So he's not a scrub walk-on out of nowhere, right? This is where he wanted to be. He wanted to come play with his brother. And last year, the coaches had a hunch he was pretty good by the way he was running the prep team, right? They're going, man, this kid can make all the throws, and he seems to have some poise. But you really don't know what you have till you get a guy in the game. So, so now they go, whoa, this kid, the moment was not too big for this kid. He was really good. He can make all the throws. He can orchestrate the offense the way you want him to run it. He took care of the football. He did everything they asked him to do. So now what do I think they're saying? Man, are we in good shape right now at quarterback? Like we have three guys that can really flat out play. That's a great position to be in. How many times do we wish that BYU had had three quarterbacks in the last several years? Uh, many years. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, so, so I, and now what they have to say is, okay, Romney had the perfect ba- – Baylor Romney had the perfect skill set for the for – the, game plan we had against Boise State. Um, So now let's look at Baylor, and is Jaron 100% healthy? Let's look at him. What's the game plan against Utah State? Are they very similar to Boise? Are we going to run the exact same game plan? Do we go with Baylor? 
or can Jaron run that just as well? And was Baylor a reflection of how good a game plan the offensive staff had? And I heard you just mention something in the last segment. I think it was you, Spencer, that said they've had thousands of reps to look at these guys, yes. right? So one game is huge because you want to see who's a gamer and who's not a gamer. Uh, I would submit that the game plan was fantastic last week, like really good, well-planned, well-orchestrated, and perfectly executed. And Baylor has you know, something to do with that. So now, if the, the the one reason you would start Baylor is if you went, do you know what? The game plan that we have to have against this Utah State defense fits Baylor's skills better than it does Jaron's skills. That's the one reason you might consider that. I would think if Jaron's 100% healthy, they, they made the decision that he was slightly better. They knew Baylor was good. Now they, or they thought Baylor was really good. Now they know he's really good. And they may play both of them in two weeks. Um, if, Please, if, no. Let's yeah, not do that. No, but and there's nothing wrong with that when they're the two and the three, right? So, and, and I just don't like the two quarterback thing. No, but here, here's the thing. That with BYU's luck in how quarterbacks have gone down, man, you gotta, you're going to prepare them both to play, yes. right, regardless yeah, of who you're yeah, going to yeah, start. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and then the question is this. If Jaron was playing last week and he had the exact same game plan, um, which was a phenomenal game plan, would he have been just as effective as Baylor? I think he probably would have been. It's not taking anything away from Baylor. He was phenomenal. Right. He was a big time Division One quarterback playing against a ranked team at home and executed it perfectly. Let's not take anything away from him. It was amazing. It's a great game plan, and it was tailored to his skill set. And he did a fantastic job. And the the biggest question I had because I've seen him throw in practice, I know he's got a good arm, and I know his mechanics are really good. That's easy to see in practice, right? So my one question was. Is the moment going to be too big for him, or is he going to be big enough for the moment? He was bigger than the moment. He yeah, was he awesome. Was really it was good. so impressive for him to go in there. And this is not a guy that's been – so I, I hate to go, hey, when I, but, but by the time I was playing in games, I had been here in this offense for three years watching All-American slash NFL guys do it and learning from them before I ever had to go in and play a play. If I – wasn't comfortable by the time I got in there, then I was a sorry. I was sorry. I was a bad player <laughs> if I couldn't play by then, right? He's been, he hasn't been the guy. He just got first team reps this last week. For him to come in and play like that tells you an un, you know, that was an unbelievable performance. Unbelievable performance. I'm afraid in the long run of losing Jaron Hall in any way. If you don't go with him saying, whoa, 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 I got a concussion now, I'm not the guy, if you if you start Baylor Romney. Now, if Jaron Hall starts and BYU's down by 21 after three quarters or something, that's different, that's right? That's not Jaron. That's not going to happen. Right, and I don't think it would happen either. But And we know Jaron wants to be here. Dad player, we know he wants to be the guy. We know that Baylor wants to pay his own way to be here. So there's there's no love loss there if you start Jaron Hall and then if you need Baylor, you, you got him. Yeah, I, I think we obviously needed both of them this year and – and in today's day and age, the as big and fast as players are, you better have two and probably three quarterbacks. And and I love that they're both here. I hate the mentality these days, and this is again taken back to the olden days, um, where a guy goes, "Oh, you're recruiting that guy? Well, then I'm not coming. Oh, you're going to sign him? I'm out. Um, oh, you're starting him? I'm done." Um, and and. And I realize that if you stick around, maybe you don't get a chance to play. Hey, I realize it more than anybody. Right? I got to right. play a little bit. And you have a freshman. You have two freshmen and right. a sophomore in the right. three, right? I, I was in the same class with Robbie Bosco, who was before a shoulder injury, was a big time NFL guy, right? Um, and I was thinking, hey, I've got to be here because at some point there's a likelihood that he may get hit, and and I will get an opportunity. And if I get an opportunity at this place to play, even if it's a half a season, then I got a chance to go on, even though I'm undersized, right? And so that was kind of the mentality that we all had back in those days. Now it's like, well, if you're going to start that guy, I'm out. Not, well, if you're going to start that guy, I'm going to be ready to play because there's a good chance that I'm going to have an opportunity. And when I get that opportunity, I'm going to be phenomenal. That's exactly what Baylor Romney did Saturday. I'm going to stick around. I'm going to keep grinding. I'm going to learn so that when I do get a chance, I'm going to be really good. And he got a chance. He was really good. And there's also the Jalen Hurts ideas right. where, yes, I left and I will thrive elsewhere. Well, so, so he did stay a full year. He right. left Alabama. Right. Like, do you think Baylor's going to transfer to Oklahoma? <laughs> no. just Do you think no. Jaron's going to transfer to Oklahoma? The principle of, I want some PT and I right. can thrive elsewhere. Right. Well, and, and yeah. remember, he was a starter on a national championship caliber football team and he got replaced by another. So he was like the number two recruit overall in the country. And he got replaced by the number three overall recruit in the country who was better. And Oklahoma's going, hey, if you want to win a national championship, <laughs> forget those guys. Come here and win one. And I am so rooting for him, by the way. 
Oklahoma's my team this year. Oh, man, I would love They're to see like Oklahoma and Alabama play in the national championship. But I don't want to awesome. play in the national championship. No? No, I want Alabama to play in the semis. Okay. Because right. I don't even want Alabama in the national. I'm so tired of them. <laughs> no disrespect because Patriots, Nick Saban's the greatest and <laughs> unbelievable yeah. coach, and they're phenomenal. I'm just tired of them, right? So I, w- I want Oklahoma and Alabama to play in the semis, and I want, I want Hurts to just go off yeah. for like 400 yards and Oklahoma to be unstoppable, and then they can go win the national championship. Okay. They can go beat Clemson in the national championship game. I would love that. All right. Because I love Lincoln Riley. Blaine, let's finish with this. What's BYU's record in the final five games? So with the changes they just made in approach defensively and offensively, I will not be surprised if they went out. But but I would expect them to to lose only one. Okay, four and one and, in the final that, five. And that'd be awesome, right? Yeah. To that go would seven be, and five in the regular season. After what we saw, yes. four and one down the stretch will be overachieving. But I, I think that that's where they're at after this last game. And uh, so I think they... And if they did that, they'd get one of the two, San Diego State or Utah State, and win the other three. And, and if that's what they finish, we should all go, yes, they turned a corner. They, people forget the number of injuries to unbelievably important players that they had to manage through. People, how did they lose to Toledo and South Florida? And I'm not excusing that because they should have been able to win with the guys they were playing with. But what teams lose their starting quarterback – they're starting running back. And for BYU, there's a way bigger drop from one to two than there is at Utah or at Washington at running back. Um, and and you're going to go lose. Before the season even started, they were planning on a starting secondary to be Austin Lee at free, Troy, Troy at strong, Diane at one corner, and Quil, Chris Wilcox at the other corner. All seniors, That's a Pac-12 way. secondary. And then we didn't have three of those guys <laughs> yeah. at one time. Yeah. Like, oh, Diane didn't play in South Florida. We didn't have hurts. three of those guys. And so they lost, and they lost who they thought was going to be the best defender on the team in Zane Anderson. So they had to manage through and figure out. You're asking who their identity is. They had to figure out their identity with different players. And then the one position where they're unbelievably deep at, they just lost a bunch of guys on the offensive line. And I'm telling you, the freshmen that played last week were phenomenal. And, and maybe that's because Jeff Grimes was down there coaching them up face-to-face after every series. Yeah. That was an unbelievable job by that offensive line this last week with a bunch of guys that were subs. And they, they turned a corner. Philosophically, they figured out what they need to do to play with this young team. And if, if we had to lose a couple of games to get to that point, and now they win out or going 4-1, and one, then – I'm sorry. I'm going to look back and go, well, maybe we need to lose those for, for Kalani and the staff to think of how can we win with this group. It created, maybe that's and, what it And you create change. momentum, and now that change goes moving forward. So I'm going to be – if they go 4-1 and one or 5-0 and oh down the stretch, yeah. I'm going to be completely fine with them losing those games because it, it ushered in change, and that change is what was needed, and, and I'm going to be okay with it. I like your logic because it's on the lines of the logic I was. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> it's conveniently mine, too. Okay, watch Blaine tonight on After Further Review. Yeah, going to be a we'll really fun episode. Break it all down. Yeah, it's always fun to do that show when they win. Oh, and, yes, and there's all, any show and, for that matter. We're always looking for highlights. There's been some games where we're like, what are we going to do? The show's going to be like three minutes long. Yeah. Hey, we have all kinds of highlights on this one. We Boise State at Boise State. (laughs) It was fun. (laughs) Thanks, Blaine. Join the conversation 24-7 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook using the hashtag BYUSN. The best of BYU Sports Nation rolls on after this. Get caught up in the week in Cougar Sports. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. Joining us now in Studio B, men's basketball assistant coach Chris Burgess, former number one rated high school basketball player in the entire country. Not bad. Yeah, I have have that as excellent. (laughs) Yeah, appreciate you guys having me on again. (laughs) So, Chris, the real secret is having been the number one rated high school player, what's the secret to going and getting a guy like that for BYU? Um. A lot of, lot of different seekers. Well, in today's kind of basketball world, it's like there's four or five schools that are going to get those top ten picks. They're just kind of, hey, you take this guy, you take this guy, right? And, and, and you know, Penny Hardaway at Memphis is one of those guys. Obviously, Duke and Kentucky, Arizona. So that, that's, a big, that's probably one of the biggest things is those top ten, top five guys are probably going to fall into those schools. And then there's, there's schools like us and, and like a school like Xavier or Butler that are trying to get into the top 50, um, top 100 ESPN kids as 
as well. For us, it's finding the right kid that wants to be part of the university, uh, wants to be part of a, a coaching staff like Coach Pope that's going to push him and drive him and, and, and win. So, but it's, there's, there's a lot that goes into it. And I know you can't say names, but signing day for basketball is in two yeah. weeks. So you guys are hitting it uh, hot and heavy right now on the recruiting Yeah, trail. a couple of those coaches are on the road right now. Today's a day off for our basketball team, at least this afternoon until tonight. And a couple of those, a couple of our coaches are on the road right now because we, we are chasing some guys. And, and um, you know, we lose a lot of seniors, as everybody knows. And we need, we need to have a really good class. And we, and we are. We're going to have a really good class, whether it's this fall or in, in the in, come November. Or sorry, come April. And it's unique because you have a bunch of guys sitting out mm-hmm. uh, that are already transferring in from Arizona, two from Utah Valley, yeah. and w- and whatnot. So uh, we're going to see a lot of new faces next year, regardless, yeah, right? We are, and you know, these guy, these three guys you're talking about, they just they're absolutely just pushing our guys in practice on that scout team. Um, like you, you can imagine, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, we have a really tough schedule, but I'm hoping that those guys, especially with Yoli too on the scout team, that scout team is just as good <laughs> as, as anybody we're going to play this year. Yoli has, the WCC. Yeah, yeah, Yoli has said as much. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you got Yoli, Barcelo, Wyatt Lowell, freshman of the year, um, and Richard Harward, who's probably the biggest monster these guys are going to play um, this season, mm. other than a, maybe three or four schools. I mean, you got a six foot ten, two sixty five pound old school center. He's going to push you every single day. And he's going to challenge you every single day. That it, I'm hoping the game you get to the games, you're like, thank goodness, <laughs> right? And so that's the goal. He would drop step you to death. Yes. Um, it, is there any chance the NCA allows any of these waivers? Because we've been seeing reports yeah. of waivers from other schools. Are you still waiting yeah. on all three of those? We are. Guys? We are still waiting. And I think I read something on social media about the waivers that have gone through. And so you don't want to get, you don't, it's not that you don't want to get your hopes up, but you just want to kind of stay the course, keep expecting them not to play. And if they do, it's just a bonus, but we have not heard back. Um, and our, and our guys, our red shirts right now, have had a really good mind frame about how they've approaching the season. And right now it's learn the plays, learn the system, learn coach, which two of them already know. And, and if they get their waivers, great. If not, they're ready to push our guys every day. Chris Burgess with us on BYU Sports Nation, BYU basketball assistant coach. Four guys like Alex Barcelo and Wyatt Lowell and Richard Harward. What is the expected timetable? Yeah. Like the drop dead date of when you absolutely should know by? Man, that's a great question. I think McKay Cannon a few years back didn't, wasn't it like the fifth or sixth game? And that seemed it was pretty late. the season, yeah. He well, found out one day and played that night against yeah, you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He played really well, too. <laughs> um, so I want to say, what was that, like six or seven games into the season? Our hope it's before that. Like, And I think for us as a staff and them as players and our teammates, right, they just they would like to know. I think the NCAA uh, has got a lot of stuff going on right now with how many waivers that are being applied and sent into them. Um, hopefully we did our jobs accordingly and got them in at the proper time so that we can find out um, before Cal State Fullerton. We are 13 days away from that That's game. crazy. <laughs> the season opener is in 13 days. How are you feeling right now? Um, feeling really good. Our guys have been working hard. And six weeks, although we're not there yet, is a long time. Plus, if you had summer of just playing against the same guys every single day. So our guys are ready for a closed scrimmage, an exhibition game, and then that opening night at Cal State Fortune. As coaches, we've been preparing as best we can to get back into the swing of things of scouting and um, you know watching personnel, watching the way they guard and how to attack it. So it's... Um, you know, we're excited, and our, I, I can't imagine. I remember what it was like as a player. You couldn't wait to play somebody new, so I know our guys are just, you know, scratching the surface to get going. Midnight Madness set yeah. the night, uh, but in the Mark Pope style, <laughs> there won't be much actual basketball. So what's going to happen tonight? Well, they'll meet the teams, right? They'll meet the men and women's, women's teams, and we're going to have just – a giant party with all these different things. And, and like the, the BYU dunk team is going to be there. The Cougarettes are going to perform. The acapella group Vocal Point is going to perform. Oh, they're big time. And then we're going to have a three little games and that are going to happen. They're not basketball related. Um, and we're just going to have a lot of fun with it. Come meet the players. The fans are going to have you know an opportunity to get out and see the team and, and interact and, and just have fun. But th- there won't be much. You know, some Midnight Mads, they'll do a dunk contest. No, we're not going to do that. There might be a skills challenge. So maybe we'll get the, the Nike basketballs out and do a little skills yeah. challenge. Okay. Okay. So, Is that the coaches or the players? I'm hoping the players because <laughs> the skills challenge, we won't go we'll through that ball through the tire. It might take us a little bit. <laughs> uh, Andy Katz has been very complimentary yeah. of the program. Uh, high expectations. Uh, Seth Davis recently said he thinks you guys are the top 40, 50 program. Those are some high expectations, yeah. especially given – First year, you only out for nine. Gavin probably out for the year, those things. Do you like that kind of uh, positivity, obviously, coming to the program, but some expectation to be in yeah. the conversation there? We like it. I, I, I also know that 
we got guys in the team and, and coaches that that likes, you know, being slided a little bit, having that chip on your shoulder. So we like it either way. Um, you know, to us, to us, we don't want it. We don't want it's just kind of noise and a distraction. And we know what's important. We know what's going on in the locker room. Um, but what they're saying, forty or fifty or third in the in the Dub CC, to be honest with you, is. We, we want to do better. We expect higher, um, especially when everyone gets back. Um, we, we expect to we expect to, no, we expect to go have Gonzaga here and, and beat them. That's just our expectation, right? And if we don't want to recruit kids or have a locker room full of guys that are okay with second and third, it's just it's just it's a loser's mentality, right? And, and and the reason Pope's won at a high level everywhere he's gone is because he has a winner's mentality, and and that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do, right? And so that's what we're telling our players, recruits, our staff, um, the Midnight Madness. That's what we're telling the fans, and, and that's what we're shooting for. First meeting uh, Greg Rubel and I had with Mark about the Pope show, yeah. he said, how do we win an Emmy? I said, are you talking about a regional Emmy? He goes, no, a national yeah. Emmy. There you go. I was like, there you go. we have never won a regional, yeah. let alone a national. <laughs> just, just to get a sense of where he that's wants exa- to go. That's yeah. exactly what you said. He sh- he, he, that's what he wants. He swings big, he wins big, and, and he played in the league, the NBA, for a long time, and he won a national championship, not because he was you know, trying to hit singles. Mm-hmm. So. So apparently our role is to put a chip on the shoulder of this team and undervalue yeah. your team, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Jerry, can, take, <laughs> can someone take else take do that? Take, can we have two of the guys to take, do that? We, we are the ones that are going to undervalue <laughs> and put a chip on that yeah, shoulder. Yeah, they're going to love that. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Can't wait for that. The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. On BYU Radio. Can you predict the future? These guys think they can. We're going for two on BYU Sports Nation. Going for two results brought to you by Bodyguards. Protection for a life worth living. Learn more at bodyguards.com. My first pick. BYU against Boise State will give up more passing yards than rush yards. It was close. Barely. BYU had been giving up 240-plus rushing yards per game to that point and only 188 through the air. Boise State passes for 185. They rush for 174. So I I get that one by 11 yards. Yeah, BYU was so bad that this one was allowed. That's why you did it. It was like (laughs) you would normally have more pay. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) They haven't done it. Pick two. This game will be determined by eight or fewer points. I was feeling uh, like this was not going to happen when BYU went up 28-10. to 10. But sure enough, the Broncos, it's college football, high level. Everyone makes a run, 28-25. So I think for the first time this year, I get both. Hallelujah. Yeah, good job. Thanks, man. Pick one. This is where I was absolutely wrong, and I couldn't be happier to be wrong. I thought Boise State would just, just pound BYU in this game, given all the circumstances coming in. I said Boise State will cover, meaning by 8+. plus. <clears throat> I'm so happy to be wrong on this one. Yep. BYU won the game. After the game, I was like, yes, I didn't get my pick. Pick two. BYU will rush for fewer than 150 yards. I didn't think BYU would be able to run the ball effectively with a banged-up ball line and forced to running back. BYU ran for 121. It was enough. It was enough. Their ga- Every game is different. In this game, 121 was enough to win. And uh, BYU didn't win the game by running the ball effectively. BYU was timely in their execution, had crucial points, and ran a couple of trick plays for touchdown passes. What was BYU's season average on the ground coming into the game? I don't remember. Yeah, okay. But, but it's, it was bottom 30. Yeah. Yeah, BYU wasn't good. And 121 was, yeah. For those keeping score at home, Blaine Fowler got both of his wrong. He said BYU would have three or more sacks. Mm. And two. And that they'd be 100% scoring in the red zone. Mm. Also, BYU yeah. missed a field goal in the red zone. That was the issue. Which, by the way, can we talk about Jake Alderoid for a moment? Um, I'm still up 9-5, by the way, in the standings. Yes, so you are. Exciting. Um, Jake Alderoid made 10 of his first 11. Jake the Meg! I still think Jake's a good kicker. I think he's a fantastic punter. He's missed four of his last seven. So that's a bit of an issue right now. I don't know what uh, is going on with Jake Alderoid, but uh, certainly needs to improve because in a close game, you need to make a field goal here or there to uh, put you over the top. Let's just go ahead and say that his nickname is now Jake the Make again, even though he doesn't like as as much as some of the other ones. Wait, once he declared that he did, it was like from that moment on, it, struggles have. Come yeah, into so play. maybe we don't talk about any nickname. Maybe? Okay, yeah. are we going to be that superstitious here? <laughs> I'm a little stitious, you know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, congratulations on your four point going for two lead. You got to you went plus one on I me know. though. You're hey, cut. You're cut. Don't call it a comeback. I'll take it. 
That wraps up the best of BYU Sports Nation this week. Tune in next Saturday for the Cougar news you need to hear. And catch the BYU Sports Nation simulcast every day at noon Eastern, 9 Pacific on BYU TV and BYU Radio.